Hello, it is your favorite Wednesday person. Uh, my name is Carmen, I'm happy to be here. If you do not know me, I am a myofunctional therapist and I am an educator extraordinaire. So I'm here every Wednesday helping you and you and you and you and you. Everybody learn about all things myofunctional therapy. So my new blog came out today and it was about the sleep apnea myofunctional therapy connection. A lot of people have no idea that that's even combined. So here in this conversation, we're diving a little bit deeper. I'm going to be talking about why sleep apnea is concerning. So if I am not a new face to you and you have heard me get on my soapbox before, you know that my path of passion is sleep apnea. I do what I do to prevent sleep apnea down the road. And so I spend a lot of time here talking with people about this. So we are going to be talking about the symptoms. We're going to talk about the long-term consequences. Um, what else? We're going to talk about the options on how to treat sleep apnea, what to do if you suspect it, and then I'll get on my soapbox again at the end. So wait patiently, grasshopper. We'll get there. And... That's it. So I'm going to just jump in. Um, the symptoms of sleep apnea are this big. So I have a list here that I'm going to go down and literally you guys, I have it labeled from A to V. So there, there's a ton of things and a lot of these things you may not realize that are even connected. I remember a patient that I had years ago as a dental hygienist and he was a doctor. He was a general physician and he came in and I did his medical history update and he said, well, I have sleep apnea. And my response was, well, did you have any idea? Were you blindsided with this? And he said, I had, I had no idea. Uh, he also told me that he didn't realize what a good night's sleep was or, you know, how crappy he was sleeping until he got a good night's sleep. So it, it really can blindside people. So I'm just going to jump in and talk about the um, the symptoms first. Okay, so here's a biggie. High blood pressure. 50% of all people who have obstructive sleep apnea have high blood pressure. So those of you who are medicating for high blood pressure, have you thought about this? Uh, I know specifically my, uh, I have family members who have had their high blood pressure identified at the eye doctor, which is kind of weird, but they can see that, see that going on in your eyes. And then, you know, they get medicated for high blood pressure, but nobody digs beyond that. And this particular family member snores like a freight train, you know, has a lot of other issues, but he takes that blood pressure pill all the time. Okay. So that's a biggie. Strokes. Um, like I said, this is my path of passion and I tell you guys all the time, sleep apnea is deadly. It's very debilitating. It's aging. It's, it's a terrible disease. So 60% of strokes can be connected to obstructive sleep apnea. How about diabetes? 40% of people with sleep apnea have diabetes. So here, here's a thing to think about. If somebody has diabetes, is their doctor cross-referencing, if you will? Are they saying, okay, well, you have diabetes. Do you have sleep apnea or the other way around? You have sleep apnea. Let's see about diabetes. Heart failure, 25%. Uh, and I think, let me see here, um, obstructive sleep apnea is reportedly responsible for 30% of heart attacks. So those are some pretty significant uh, concerns there. Let's talk about some uh, other things here. Obesity. So we all think that sleep apnea is only for fat middle-aged men with a big neck, you know, built like a barrel with this big waist. That is not the case at all. So while obesity is a concern, it put, uh, the extra fat puts weight and pressure on the throat, the neck, the soft palate, and the jaw muscles. So that's a concern, but it's not the only way that we see sleep apnea show up. And so those of you who are skinny, or maybe you have a kiddo with failure to thrive, uh, that, that failure to thrive, that puny little, little kid can be the result of not getting the human growth hormone, which your body secretes at night. So you got to get into the deep sleep to get that. And when I have kiddos in front of me and they're, they're just kind of scrawny, that is a big red flag. Uh, 
GERD, so gastroesophageal reflux disease. I believe that's what that's called. Uh, and acid reflux. You guys, stop taking your medicine without digging a little bit deeper. Well, I shouldn't say stop taking your medicine, but try and find the root cause. If you have acid reflux and you have sleep apnea concerns, medicating it doesn't solve it. It doesn't make it go away. And acid reflux is a huge concern for my population of clients. So that's a big symptom. Another is depression and anxiety. And so if any of you guys got my, uh, my email that went out today, if you're on my email list, you know that this hits very uh, close to home, very personal for me because I have a daughter with, with obstructive upper airway resistance syndrome and sleep apnea. And she has suffered at times from crippling depression and anxiety. Doctors want to just throw a pill at her and label her, but it is a picture. You know, there's more to the picture. So this can be, uh, this, this ruins quality of life for people. My daughter would love to feel motivated and have energy and sleep at night, but instead she lives with night terrors and the sweats and racing heart. And you know, when we do our sleep study, we can see what, that she sits straight up in her bed at night her pulse is racing, you know, all of these things. Sleep apnea isn't just the, the big things, but it's the little things that add up, okay? So depression and anxiety is, is a big symptom. Um, brain fog, memory problems, that's a biggie. The cost of Alzheimer's disease is heinously expensive, you guys. And waiting until you get to that point in life where you start having cognitive issues, you don't want to go there. Uh, I, told, I said aging, so accelerated aging, we see that. Chronic pain. And what I like, how I like to explain this to my clients is when somebody has chronic pain, it's like chronic pain. Gosh, I can't talk today. It is like a two-year-old who needs a nap. Somebody who is tired, everything hurts, their tolerance is just low, they're cranky. This is a big picture. This is a big problem, okay? So chronic pain, I see this a lot. You probably have already heard of daytime sleepiness, having accidents, whether that's driving a car, whether that's having something happen at work. Daytime drowsiness is a big thing. Um, grinding your teeth. So sleep, um, grinding at night. Some people grind during the day, but very um, commonly it is sleep boxing. Uh, okay, let's talk about that big neck. So men, if they're, if you have a neck larger than 17 inches, women a neck larger than 16 inches, that's a concern. Um, enlarged tonsils and adenoids, a retruded jaw, or call, it's called retronathia. So when I study somebody, a client of mine, and I look at their profile, so I look at nose, lip, lip, chin, if I see that going backwards, then that is a receded mandible. So that just indicates that there was a craniofacial develop a growth problem and that the face did not finish growing adequately forward. So when we see somebody with that retruded chin, or if they have a condition of a ret retruded chin, like something like Pierre Robin syndrome, that kind of stuff, you can almost guarantee that their airway volume is not what we would want that to be. So it can be a concern. Uh, another one, frequent urination. So I, I want to direct this just, uh, it, it doesn't only happen to men, but a lot of my clients are men that have sleep apnea. And really what happens is they, they connect this with a prostate issue, but it really isn't. So frequent urination, having trouble going back to sleep, that's really the, um, the fight or flight that's going on. So it's the stress hormones and a lot of men like to dismiss it as it being a prostate issue. So uh, that's one of the things that I always say, well, let's dig a little bit deeper. Another thing here for men is erectile dysfunction. This is not something that men generally want to deal with uh, or they don't want to associate it. And so what happens is I would maybe have somebody that I'm doing a medical history update on and they're fighting the sleep apnea conversation. They're, they're fighting having a sleep study done, but as soon as they have trouble with erectile dysfunction and they get a medicine for that, then suddenly they want to do something about it. And then very often they go have a sleep study and they find out that they, that they've had sleep apnea all along.
So it can all connects. Uh, and then insomnia. This is another thing that my daughter really struggles with. And one of the examples or one of the best explanations that I give to people is if your body is awake, it's alive. Okay. And so it's saying, you know what? I'm right here. I'm good. I'm alive. I'm breathing. So we're going to just stay up and watch another episode of Sex in the City or CSI or whatever it is, your Grey's Anatomy you're watching. Um, but they go through these periods of time. Like my daughter, she falls asleep. Then she has this panic. She's awake and the body says, nope, I'm alive. I'm breathing. Let's just stay awake here because it's better than the alternative, which is suffocating all night long because your brain remembers what's going on in the inside. You might wake up in the morning feeling like poop, feeling like you've been run over by a John Deere. You haven't slept well. You're exhausted. You're getting fat because your energy is low. I mean, it's a vicious, vicious cycle, but you might wake up in the morning and you don't remember what all went on in the night, but on the inside, there's a recording. Everything that's going on, it is bad on the inside of your body. So I took you through, like I said, A to V of symptoms. The list is this long. It's different for children. For children, there are daytime indicators and then there's nocturnal indicators. So those can be a little bit different. If you suspect either an adult or a child, it is so important to dig, okay? The long-term consequences. So I have some, uh, some information here. A third to a half of people with chronic sleep problems have mood disorders. And the problem is, is that a lot of these people are getting labeled they get medicine and they never, they get a bandaid on a bullet wound. They never get anybody who cares to dig deeper. Uh, insomnia has a 20% risk for anxiety or a 20 times greater risk for anxiety and a 10 times greater risk for depression. So huge concern there. Also, and I touched on this a little bit before, obstructive sleep apnea is uh, reportedly responsible for 49% of high blood pressure cases and 30% of heart attacks. So this is not something to be ignored. Um, next, I'm going to briefly touch on the options for treating obstructive sleep apnea. So first is the CPAP, the continuous positive airway pressure. So it, it essentially forces air into you to keep your structures open. This is the gold standard for moderate to severe sleep apnea, and it's a good option for mild, but let me tell you this, compliance is less than 40%. So it's hard to save somebody's life if it just sits over on the nightstand. The other thing is many clients, I've had many clients who get a CPAP and not a single person has ever asked them or shown them how to use it properly or to make sure that they're using it properly. So even if you're one of those rare people who are being compliant with your CPAP, do you know that it's working? That's really important to look at. Um, the next option, so that was the CPAP. Uh, the next option is an oral appliance. So this is effective for mild to moderate sleep apnea. You've got a couple options. One is the mandibular advancement device, which is gonna bring the jaw forward to, uh, to get the tongue out of the throat and to open the airway. And then you have the option for uh, what's called a biomimetic expander. And these are like retainers on the top and bottom, which help expand the face so that you can get growth, so that you can have growth of the jaw, the craniofacial skeleton, and a, a wider airway is a byproduct of this. Um, it is important if you're doing oral appliances that you have somebody that knows what they're doing because a consequence of having a mandibular advancing appliance, uh, advancing appliance uh, is that you can have damage to the joint. You can also develop what's called an open bite. So great, you're not snoring anymore or you don't have sleep apnea concerns, but now you can't eat steak because you can't touch your teeth together. So definitely have to have somebody who understands what that. Um, the third option is surgery. And then the fourth option is what we call behavior and sleep position changes. So those behavior issues could be weight loss, obviously, um, sleeping on the side versus the back. I have some client clients who sleep on their side and they're fine, but as soon as they sleep on their back, then they have apnea. So, uh, making those changes, of course, is going to help. So what is the best option? So first, the key to choosing between a CPAP and an appliance is compliance. 
uh, I'm going through this with my daughter. There is no way she wants to do a CPAP, so we knew that going the route of an appliance with an experienced provider is is going to be the important thing. So compliance is it, it is absolutely important. And it really doesn't matter which is better, Is what matters is does it solve your problem at the root cause. So that again is a conversation for you and your doctor. Next I wanna talk about why we need a paradigm shift. So um, what I mean by this is that, that we have to change our thinking. So many of my patients are victims of a healthcare system that has created these divisions between dental, between um, medical, between mental health, all of that stuff. Uh, the inside your body, they, there are not these lines of demarcation. There are not these divisions. Um, healthcare these days is not about health, but it's more about managing disease. And that's not what you want. Um, and, and again, I, I share with you about my daughter. A great example of this is we have learned how flawed our healthcare system is, our healthcare, you know, I use that term loosely. Um, if she, you know, she's 23, if she was 63, getting her sleep apnea diagnosed would be a lot easier because they use different parameters. So my question is, if we have such a good healthcare system, why is it difficult to diagnose a 23 year old versus a 63 year old? There shouldn't be a different standard for the person who's older and who's on, medic, uh, on Medicare. Um, next, the other thing is, is it can take 17 years for a paradigm shift. This is a long time, you guys, and this is a lot of dead people or diseased people or unhealthy people. When we know better, we do better. And that's the problem is, so this, this thinking depends on where somebody was trained. It depends really on if they stay up to date on cutting edge stuff. I have found that if there's an older doctor or potentially somebody who's getting ready to retire, they may not be up to date on the latest and greatest information, research, that kind of stuff, because they're kind of already have one foot out the door. Um, so our hope is the new, very aggressive, you know, very educated young doctors will be learning about this stuff and making a change. But 17 years is a long time. Okay. Um, a, a dentist has to evolve from teeth to a focus on healthcare and wellness. Um, a, the silo mentality, I talked about this recently on my, uh, on my Instagram. We cannot live like this anymore. We can't have blinders on for what is in our area. We have to widen our horizon a little bit so that we can benefit people. Sleep apnea is the, is one of those big things and it, it's, it's really sad because many people get overlooked. So that's why I feel like it's really my job to get information out there to you. So, you know, if you have any of these sim symptoms, start digging. Um, so that leads me to what you can do if you or a family member suspect that you have sleep apnea. So this happens a lot. I might have a conversation with somebody and they go home to their dad or their grandfather, their husband, uh, and they have this conversation. So passing this information along is very helpful also. You have to start somewhere. So you can start with, with me, you can start with either a free assessment or a, a, a comprehensive exam. The nice thing with a free assessment is it gives you a chance to meet me, make sure it makes sense for you to move on to an exam. You can see what it's like to do teletherapy with me because that's the only way that I do it but it gives you a starting place. Keeping your head in the sand, no. I know people in their 40s and 50s who don't get to have another 4th of July because they had, uh, because they're dead from complications of sleep apnea. So you don't want, you do not, you do not want that. Um, so there's the free assessment, then you can do a comprehensive exam. That's always the next step. What I do when I do that comprehensive exam is I am looking to pass the buck meaning I am looking to say, yes, I see this. Yes, I see this. Yes, I see this. And you need to go talk to your doctor. If somebody has concerns for uh, sleep disordered breathing that indicate a, a possible concern for sleep apnea, I pass the buck so that your doctor can be the one to be, I, I, I want to sleep at night. And so I do not want to overlook that with anybody. Okay. 
Uh, and so I, I send a lot of people for a, a conversation or for a sleep study with their doctor. So if you suspect it, do not ignore it. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your long-term health to do something about it now. Um, so oh, something that I talk about also, and I've talked about this before, when we talk about that free assessment, you can also go to the bottom of any one of my blogs, and I'll put the link up here now. You can get this quick assessment tool. There's 25 questions. These are the 25 most important questions that I ask when I do a comprehensive exam. This gives you a chance to just walk through and evaluate. Do some self-assessing and see how many yeses you come up with. People email me and they say, Carmen, I had 24 out of 25 yeses or I had 20 out of 25. That gives you a pretty good idea that you've got a problem, Houston, and you need to do something about it. So you can start there. Um, and like I said, that's at the bottom of any one of my blogs. Um, next week, I'm going to talk about grinding. So this kind of also goes hand in hand with sleep apnea concerns. Grinding, I have worked in lots of dental offices when I was a hygienist and I have witnessed many dentists say, oh, grinding's just normal. Let me hear it. Let me give you a several hundred dollar appliance, but I'm not going to lift and look any further. And that is patchwork care. And so there's a time and a place for those, but also, we have to look and dig a little bit deeper. We don't want to put band-aids on bullet wounds. So next week, I'm going to be talking about grinding. So do not forget, you can get your quick assessment tool. You know how to find me. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm all over. We do have a YouTube channel. I do have the Tongue Tie and Myofunctional Therapy Support Group. You can join that. Uh, any of this information, share it. Your loved ones, anybody who has myofunctional impairment, eventually their, um, their compensations run out. Your body can compensate for up to 20 years. And what happens if you ignore it now, then it becomes a, a problem down the road. So the long-term consequences of this stuff, you don't want to ignore. Um, I will see you guys next week where I'm going to be talking about grinding. Everybody have a very safe, very safe Fourth uh, of July. Love up on your families. Remember the price of freedom is not free. Um, you guys know my sweetheart is a Marine, so I'm very passionate about our, uh, you know, my patriotism. Enjoy, be safe, and I will see you guys next week.